أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم أخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا بنور الفهم وافتح علينا بمعرفة العلم وسهل أخلاقنا بالحلم وجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه اللهم اجعل أعمالنا خالصة لوجهك ولا تجعل فيها حظا لغيرك وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين والحمد لله رب العالمين السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته How's we doing today? الحمد لله الحمد لله We uh, continue with our uh, trying to understand some of the hikam of Ibn Atayillah rahimahullah ta'ala uh, we were busy with two hikam in particular yesterday I think it was number 10 and then 11 um, I just want to revisit some points in relation to those so the first one was Al-A'malu suwarun qa'imah wa arwahuha wujudu sirri al-ikhlasi fiha Al-A'malu suwarun qa'imah wa arwahuha وجود سر الإخلاص فيها. Actions are lifeless forms and their spirit or their life force is the secret of sincerity in them. Right? Now, there were a few questions that came yesterday and I think we'll just touch on some of those. One was, um, you know, based on the discussion we had around Ikhlas and that being um, not doing things for other than Allah and not even allowing your nafs a portion in the good that you do such that it starts to gain self-amazement right? um, and in light of that discussion we were speaking about self-effacement right? um, so recognizing the imperfection of your nafs or focusing on the ayub of your nafs, the, uh, the flaws within your nafs to blind you from the mahasin or the beautiful traits in your nafs so that you don't become self-deluded or subjecting yourself to some uh, difficult circumstances in order to uh, abase yourself, to keep yourself low. All right? So the question came, well, how does one realize that but at the same time ensure that they don't become despondent like when thinking of the worthlessness of their nafs and reminding themselves of the worthlessness of their nafs how does that um, and perhaps um, when they recognize that i'm not on any of those high levels and they constantly focus on that how does how do they protect themselves from being uh, how do they protect themselves from being becoming despondent and thinking I'm so worth so little that you know I'm just gonna give up right and I think the first point is that as a as a believer we have to frame our minds correctly right because what what may lead to such a thought what may lead to such a thought is that we think to ourselves that if I'm focusing on myself and I see worthlessness in myself, then I can become despondent. Because in reality, if we're thinking about these things correctly as our mashayikh teach us, as the, 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 the Quran teaches us and the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teach us, then we would recognize that when we see our faults and our worthlessness, it actually makes us happy. It actually makes us happy. And this is not the happiness of being pleased with oneself and thinking a lot of oneself, but it's an elation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared me to see his perfection. That in me seeing worthlessness in myself before every other creation, because if I can see worthlessness in myself, then I can see the, uh, the paltry nature of every other creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's a state of preparedness to see the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it should actually make us happy. 
And there's some there's a statement, I think it's attributed to Ali radiallahu anhu, sometimes mentioned as a hadith. Uh, but I'm not sure of the takhreej of it exactly. It says, Tuba liman shagalahu ayubuhu an ayubin nas. Glad tidings to the one who his busyness with his own flaws keeps him veiled from the flaws of others. So I just want to focus on that first part. That idea the Tuba. Liman shagalahu ayubun nas. It says to us, Glad tidings to the one who's busied with his own flaws. So what we learn from that is the idea that when I'm busy with my own flaws, it should make me happy, not in an arrogant way, not in a way that I'm exulting and thinking a lot of myself, but it should make me happy that, you know, perhaps in Allah making me focused on my flaws, He's helping me to remove them and He's helping me to see His greatness. Right? And so it should not that idea of seeing the worthlessness of oneself or one's own uh, errors should not lead to despondency. Does that answer the question? Does it? Yeah. So, so it's just a framing around how seeing the worthlessness of our, of our nafs is. And another point, when we speak about this is, we speak about the worthlessness of our nafs, not the worthlessness of our entirety. Because you aren't your nafs. Right? You are actually your qalb. You are your qalb. And your qalb has many faculties. You have the aql, the intellect, you have the ruh, the spirit which is divinely gifted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if blown into you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it cannot be worthless. Right? But the nafs, the part of you that yes serves a good function and that is to maintain your body, it is the part of you that can drag you down. And it is the part of you that leads to self-amazement and arrogance and riyah and all of those things. It is the part of you that drives you to all of that. So when I say we must focus on the worthlessness of our nafs, it doesn't mean that we must ignore the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored Bani Adam. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا Bani Adam. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave honor to, to mankind. So, but you see, if you are freed, if you recognize the worthlessness of your nafs and what it calls to, then that recognition of the honor that Allah gave to Bani Adam, it won't delude you into self-amazement. And in fact, you will know that there's only honor to Bani Adam on account of Allah assigning it on account of Allah giving it. And it won't be a deluding uh, sense of, of, of honor. Right? So again, when you think about the worthlessness of your nafs, that part of you that tries to pull you down from your higher self, from fulfilling the purpose of your qalb and inclining to what your ruh pulls you up to through the divine, divine breeze of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in abasing that, you are simply protecting yourself from having thoughts of grandeur that delude you. Right? So I hope that answers that first question of, of despondency. Right? Um, another point on that is that we say that the, that the actions are lifeless forms and the sincerity in them are the life force in them, right? So we said that the forms without the life force are useless. It's like a dead corpse, right? But our understanding of the world that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created things in is that whilst the body needs that life force, it needs that spirit to be alive and to be worthwhile. So too does the spirit need a body in which to live. So too does the spirit need a body in which to live. So if the sincerity is the life force of our actions, that life force doesn't have a locus in which to exist if we don't have the actions to start with. Right? So... 
No matter how measly or flawed our actions may be, we should still strive to have the presence of those actions and then strive for them to be filled with life. Or simultaneously strive for them to be filled with life. We can't say, I'm going to become despondent because of the lack of quality of the life force in that body and then not have the body to start with. Because then there's no possibility for the ikhlas to exist there either. So we shouldn't say, we shouldn't come to a point where we say that if I, if there is some flaw in the quality of my ikhlas in that action, that I'm going to leave the action altogether. Because now you are going from having a body without the correct life force to not having a life force, nor a body in which you can potentially have a life force to start with. Right? However, that applies at different levels. Right? That's why I used the word the quality of the ikhlas. Because yesterday I gave an explanation of ikhlas in two parts. And that explanation was that ikhlas is removing from your interaction with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala including your own nafs. Right? But that manifested in two things. Riya and ujb. Right? Riya and ujb. Riya was when we're doing something and our purpose in doing that thing is that other people look at us. Right? And ujb is that sickness when we do things and we allow our own nafs to look at our actions and think a lot of itself. Right? But these are two different levels of a similar thing. Of your gaze being turned to other than Allah. But the one is more severe than the other. Right? So... For your action to be valid, for your action to be valid and, and in the least acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you must, your action must be free of riya. And for your action to be perfect and sound, it must be free of ujr. I'm going to say it again. For your action to be like at a basic level acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for it to be valid, it must be free of riya. Because if there's riya, you're doing it for other than Allah. Right? So you're not rewarded for that. When you make salah, you have to make salah for, you, for Allah. If you're not making salah for Allah, that salah is not accepted. Right? But the absence of ujb, of self-amazement, is a condition for the perfection of your action. So a degree of ujb may enter your action, but it doesn't render the action invalid. But riya would render the action invalid. Right? If you intend to do something for, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so there's levels to it. Right? And obviously, we strive always to go from a low, the lower level to the higher level. To go from the lower level to the higher level. So, the base level is, I mustn't do things for other than Allah. The, the higher level to strive for is, in addition to not doing things for other than Allah, I mustn't do things to satiate and please my own nafs. And again, I reiterate, when I say doing something not to please your nafs, I don't mean that if you find pleasure in the remembrance of Allah, or you find pleasure in the worship of Allah, that you must stop doing that. What I mean by to please yourself, I mean is to appeal to the dictates of your nafs. Your nafs wants to satiate itself and think a lot of itself. Right? So when you're doing something and it's leading to that kind of pleasure of your nafs, then it's bad. It's something that you must remove. But if you find yourself in the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you find yourself enjoying it, not in a manner that leads to self-amazement or arrogance, then that's actually a favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That could potentially signal the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is allowing you to experience the nafahat, the divine breezes that he sends through ibadah. Right? So it's a, it's a subtle thing, but know the difference. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say to Bilal radiallahu anhu, 
وإن تاع نفوس ولا ود كم أرحنا بها يا بلال. He would instruct Bilal رضي الله عنه to call the adhan by telling him, "Oh adhan, give us rest by calling it. And give us rest and give us peace and solace by calling the adhan. Why it's time for salah? And there is a special enjoyment and pleasure for the person that's able to put his nafs aside when engaging in that action. Right? And Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he also says. جُعِلَتْ قُرَّةُ عَيْنِي فِي الصَّلَاةِ The coolness of my eyes have been placed in salah. What does the coolness of one's eyes mean? The thing that pleases you. The things that brings you joy and happiness. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us that my pleasure and my enjoyment has been placed in salah. So there's a difference when I say... Uh, Maybe you sit in the Mizan Dikir tonight, yeah, we have uh, Brother Shaheed leading a Dikir, mashallah, and you're feeling it and you're enjoying it. It doesn't mean that you must say, oh, this is my nafs, I must leave this Dikir. Maybe I must go have a coffee outside. No. <laughs> right? You must enjoy that Dikir. But you must ensure that your heart, your nafs, your action is free of the inclination or the pools of your, of your nafs. You're not looking for the hav of your nafs in that. And one sign that you're not looking for the portion of your nafs in that action is that the day when you don't feel it, the day when you're not you know, on cloud nine, you still do it. The day when you perhaps don't have that attraction, but you've set out something for yourself to do, that you still do it anyways. Right? You don't tell yourself you're going through a period now that I'm not, uh, you know, feeling the ladha or the pleasure of my actions. And so on account of me not feeling that pleasure of my actions, I'm just not going to do those actions. I'm going to be listless when I make salah and I'm going to, you know, forego making adhkar and I'm going to do all of these things because I'm not feeling it now. No. In fact, that state of contractedness is possibly a gift to you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take you to a higher state to take you to a higher state of bust when you're feeling it and you're having that experiences to an even greater degree. But you must have that mujahada. And so at times Allah gives you moments when you are experiencing things fully. You are experiencing states with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fully. And at other times you're not feeling it. But you must remember, you're not looking for the portion of your nafs in that action. You're not doing the action on account of the pleasure that you derive from the action. You're doing the action on account of the fact that it's pleasing to Allah, not pleasing to you. Right? So that's very uh, important as well. Al-a'malu suwarun qa'imah wa arwahuha wujudu sirril ikhlasi fiha. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the realization. Naam. And then we said, we said that um, having ikhlas gives life to your action and preserves your actions. But khumul, obscurity, preserves your sincerity. Having sincerity preserves your actions and having obscurity preserves your, your sincerity. Right? And so we started speaking about that idea of khumul, uh, of obscurity. And we started by speaking of that obscurity by one, by one ensuring that they have the right frame of mind in relation to their own nafs. Right? We said either they identify the intrinsic imperfection of their nafs and so they are automatically ready to not look for perfection in their nafs because they know it is intrinsically imperfect, so they look for that perfection in Allah. And then you have those who they cannot see the intrinsic imperfection in their nafs. They see some things of perfection, qualities of perfection in their nafs, and they see qualities of imperfection in their nafs, but they are enabled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to focus on the perfections in their nafs or the mahasin of their nafs, so that not by intrinsically seeing the imperfection of their nafs, but by their focus, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows them to return their gaze to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? 
And then the third category of people was the person who isn't there yet. He looks at himself and he sees very good qualities in his nafs. So he said, such a person who can neither intrinsically see the imperfection of himself or nor see the net imperfection of himself, he should subject himself to such conditions that allow him to see the imperfection of himself or the lowliness of himself. So what do you mean by that? We said he should subject himself, and I mentioned yesterday, to some permissible things or at times some makru things to allow himself to see the lowliness of himself. Right? So you may find this strange. You may find this strange, but I'll explain inshallah. So what do we mean here? You see, this person, this person is in like a state of Cardiac arrest. He's having a spiritual heart attack. He's sick. The person who his mind is overpowered by looking at his own beautiful traits. Right? He looks at himself and he thinks, you know, I'm doing good here. I'm doing good there. I'm like quite an overall good guy. Um, and when I say good guy, he thinks, you know, I'm that old. Maybe I'm a wali. Yeah? Then he's in a state of deep sickness, a spiritual cardiac arrest, and he needs some uh, he needs some cure. He maybe needs somebody to come to him and give him some what do you call that when they pump the chest CPR. Yeah. He needs some spiritual CPR. So then, usually with advice of a sheikh, he would subject himself to some either permissible things or makru things, but not impermissible things. Right? In order to find cure. And listen to me now clearly, because I said something that you might find strange. You must do some, at times some makru things in order to find cure. But you see, when something is makru, but there is a need for that thing, right? There is a haja, perhaps not a dire, dire need, but there is a need for that thing. Then the karaha gets removed. Then it's no longer makru. Or maybe I should explain it like this. You're doing fiqh with Mawlana Yahya. In fiqh, we focus on the actions of human beings, right? And we focus on what command Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives in relation to any action. And essentially, the fuqaha, they break that down to five commands from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Five levels of command. Either Allah commands you to do something in a definitive way, such that if you don't do that thing, you'll be punished. That's what we call, what we call that? Fardu wajib. Right? The Shafi's make no distinction between the two. Or... Allah commands you to do something, but if you don't do that thing, Allah won't punish you. If you do it, He'll reward you. So in the first one, wajib, if you do it, Allah rewards you. If you don't do it, He punishes you. The second one, if you do it, Allah rewards you. If you don't do it, He doesn't punish you. Right? The third one, you may order them differently. The third one is, the thing is mubah. If you do it, it's fine. If you don't do it, it's fine. Right? And if you do that permissible thing with a good intention, then perhaps on account of that intention, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it rewarding for you. But intrinsically, it's just a mundane act. Like eating. If you, like maybe, okay, now it's haram for me to eat now. But let's say after we've broken our fast and, and I've eaten um, something, and so there's another thing that I can eat, but um, I don't have to eat it. Nor can I not eat it. It's not haram for me to eat. So what about that thing? It doesn't matter if I eat it or I don't eat it. It's okay. But if I couple it with some good intention, and then it may become rewarding. The fourth one is makruh. If I don't do the thing, Allah will reward me. 
if I do the thing, Allah won't punish me. Right? So, and the last one is haram. If I do the thing, Allah will punish me. If I don't do the thing, Allah will reward me. So I said, usually if something is wajib or mustahab, you should do it all the time. If I tell you something is sunnah, you must strive to do it all the time. But now I'm saying this person who's in a state of cardiac arrest, a spiritual cardiac arrest, he must at times resort to some things that are either permissible or makru, but he's going to do them with a good intention. So if it's mubah, it will become rewarding for him. And if it's makru, the, the, the dislike that is attached to it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is removed on account of the extraneous circumstances that require that thing. So, what may be an example of that? You may find that the ulama would perhaps suggest for that person that they must do something, they must, you know, maybe if people have this idea that they're so pious and, and that's starting to affect them. Because remember, this person is beset with such thoughts about himself that leads to self-amazement. He's unable to obscure himself from himself. So what must he do? He must do some things that the ordinary folk do. Go sit by Nando's and have a good charm. Because you're the one that, you know, you're so meticulous about everything. And this must be like that. And the food must be dry so that your enough says no share in it. And so you're starting to think a lot of yourself. No, go have some Nando's. Be like the normal people. Or you're always wearing, you know, very basic clothing. And so everybody thinks, look at this person. They're so pious and their clothes are so coarse and all of those things. No. Maybe then you must wear something fancy. It's mubah, isn't it? Mubah, wear something nice, wear something fancy. That will avert the gaze of people from you. And in averting their gaze from you, it will help you to avert your own gaze from yourself. It's mubah. Right? Or go out, be with the people, go have fun somewhere a little bit, do things like that. It will avert the gaze of people from you and it will avert it will help you to avert your own gaze from yourself because now you're just like the normal folk listen to what i said again you do something that is mubah i didn't say you do something that's haram because there are some wayward people what they would do is they decide well they beset with this thing, they think a lot of themselves, now they go drink some alcohol. And that makes them feel like a sinner. No, they are sinning. They are sinning. And the ulama say that doing that sin kills your state. You see, if you're applying some CPR to the person or some, you know, using that defibrillator and you are doing some, you know, pulses to the person, you're applying such a pulse that will hopefully wake the person up. But they say that the haram is like such a pulse that will kill you. That kills your state. So don't think that you can go to a haram to awaken you. The haram is too heavy, it will kill you. It will kill your state. But the mubah, that's okay. And the makruh, if done for the purposes of dawa, it won't kill your state. Because the karah is removed when there is a need for that thing. So sometimes the mashayikh would have, the teacher would tell them, the teacher would tell them, go put on clothes of a beggar. You, go put on clothes of a beggar. And then you go, sit with the beggars, and you beg with him. Because begging can be between haram and makruh. And this would obviously be in a state where it is makru. But on account of it being something that would awaken your state or enable you to be saved from self-amazement, at times the sheikh would tell the student, go, not just go eat with the people and, you know, maybe attend one of the gatherings of enjoyment or something like that. No. They would tell them, go and sit with the beggars and beg. And don't beg like you're fulfilling a task of your teacher. Beg like you need the money. And they would leave them to do that until the nafs is broken. 
And especially so, um, there was one person who was like a wazir, a, a governor, a shushtari. He went to his teacher and he told his teacher, you know, I've been, for 30 years I've been worshipping Allah, I've been attending your gatherings and I've been doing all of these things, but I don't experience the states that you're talking about. So his teacher told him, even if you worship for a lifetime more, you still won't experience it. Because you are veiled by your own nafs. You are veiled by your own nafs. So what he told him to do is, go to a barber, let him shave your head, let him shave your beard. And obviously that's on the opinion that it's makru to shave your beard. Obviously with haram, for those who deem it haram, they would never give such an advice. Shave your beard, take a bag around your neck, put it around your neck, fill it with hazelnuts, and uh, go into the marketplace with a drum, and then you beat the drum around there. And you tell the children to do things. And if they do what you tell them to do, then you give them some nuts. So the person said, but I'm a wazir, I'm a person of ilm, I'm a person of ibadah, I can't do this. I'm a person of standing in the community. If people see me with a shaven beard and a shaven head and this uh, like fancy clothes on that he told him to put on, find me doing these funny things, then they will, uh, it will be belittling, I can't do this. So his teacher told him, but you said, I told you that I'm, I'm going to tell you to do this thing and you won't do it and you won't be able to do it. But you told me, you insisted that I tell you. So I'm telling you, you must do it. And uh, eventually he did that. Until such a time that he would go into the marketplace and he would beat his drum and give the children nuts and he would play with him. Until a time that they say he started singing in the marketplace in such words of poetry that are the poets of the people who know, of the poems of the people who know Allah. He started singing such words which, which come out of the mouths of the lovers of Allah. So, at times, the mashayikh would advise for you a state of, they would, in extraneous circumstances, they would advise for you to engage in something that is mubah or makru on account of saving yourself. And that's an extreme case that I gave you now. I don't expect everybody to now go shaving their beards and start acting like clowns. I don't do that. If you're going to do something like that, please consult a sheikh that can advise you properly. Um, but at times, there are mubah things that you can do. When you think that you're getting ahead of yourself, go out a little bit. Sometimes in your pursuit for piety and then you, you, know, you forego like simple pleasures in life. No, sometimes engage in that to take you down from that thought of yourself. Right? To take you down from that thought of yourself. Mingle with the people, spend some time with people, have fun, go out, uh, you know, wear nice clothes. And perhaps that will help you stay. And sometimes, if you're actually on the other end, you, you ask, so you can see these two things that I mentioned to you now, they're, they're like in stark contrast to, the, to each other. The one is perhaps when you are in a state of, you know, you're wearing the coarse clothing and you're eating, you're living a very austere life and a very ascetic life. So it might be then that you go to do some normal things. You wear some nice clothes and you eat some nice food and you take yourself away from that. And at other times it might be that you are, at other times it might be that you are on the apparent you are sound and you have honor and you are a person of jah in the community and a person of status, right? Then perhaps what is required is for you to tend over a little bit to the side of, of a fakir, of a poverty. To then wear the tattered clothes, to wear the, the, you know, the, the clothes of the poor people whose edges are not nicely overlocked and are a, bit, a little bit rugged. Right? Because that might bring you down to earth. So some of the mashayikh would say, our way is, our way is, khumulun fil dhuhur wa dhuhurun fil khumul. Sometimes we make ourselves apparent to attain obscurity and sometimes we find obscurity 
in making ourselves apparent. Or uh, it's the same thing. We make ourselves apparent to attain that obscurity. And sometimes we make ourselves obscure to attain a different type of dhuhur uh, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Presence with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you can see these things are fine things. And that's why it's very important to, to have somebody help you. To have a guide. To have a shaykh. To have a knowledgeable friend. To have somebody that can help you along this way. Just now we all start acting like clowns and that's not what Allah would be pleased with from us. Nor is it what will help our state. Or we start living an extremely austere lifestyle that neither we can handle nor our family can handle and leads us to a different type of ruin. Right? So that is uh, extremely important. So that was talking about that idea of khumul or obscurity from, from oneself. Because this obscurity, the normal state, is that your nafs, it's actually a ni'mah from Allah, but your nafs doesn't like it. The norm is that your nafs doesn't like obscurity. Only when, once you become freed from that, that uh, temptation of your nafs, or that nafsi pull downwards, only then will you start to appreciate and actually find pleasure in the state of obscurity. And that's why I mentioned to you, that's where you find many of the mashayikh. Because after being freed from their nafs, whether they're living lives, whether they have nice clothes on, or they're eating nice food, or they don't have nice food, and they don't have nice clothes, and they're living a very, uh, they're wearing tattered clothing and stuff like that, it doesn't matter to them. Because they're not, they're not really focused on the means that they're living amidst. They're focusing on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who's ever all witnessing. So it doesn't matter if the means are there or if the means are not there. Right? And so it doesn't matter. And, and actually on account of that, they prefer obscurity. They prefer obscurity. They prefer to be on their own, away from people, away from the eyes of people. And they don't mind being with people when people are not imposing upon them, you like this or you like that, if they know that it affects them. But if it doesn't affect them, they don't mind also. Because like I said yesterday, they don't make ta'zim of nas. They won't take the statement of a person out of context because they know, look here, you also the bearer of a nafs that's lowly. So why should I take your praise? I want the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it doesn't matter to them. But like I said, that is a very high state. That's a very high state. And um, I think it would be folly for most of us to assume that we're there. No, when people praise us, it affects us. When we see praiseworthy things from ourselves, it affects us. So we should take the appropriate measures to protect ourselves from that. Bi-idni subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, there was another question yesterday. So, I mean, I actually wanted to, was going to go on to the next one, but I thought to, to, to mention this is important. And uh, that is... Uh, Shavan, can you can you read that question for me from yesterday, please? I remember the question, but I can't remember it exactly. So I can give you the answer, but I think with the question, it will be have more context. Uh, what about doing actions for the reward? Uh, Allah promises us is that the nafs focus. Ah. What about doing? actions for the reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises us. That is that also a focus of the nafs? It can be and it cannot be. It can be and it cannot be. I'm going to explain. So, ikhlas, I'm quoting here from Ibn Ajiba. He says, ikhlas is of three levels. Ikhlas is of three levels. Right? He says there is the level of the ordinary folk, there is the level of the elect servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the special slaves of Allah, and then there is the level of the elect of the elect, the very special slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So he says the ikhlas, the sincerity of the ordinary folk is 
removing other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, removing creation from the interaction with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whilst at the same time seeking about seeking the portion of the dunya and the portion of the akhirah. They not doing like I told you, like I told you before. You can't do it for Riyah, you can't do it for other than Allah. That's gonna render your action invalid. So yeah, I'm saying you have ikhlas. You have ikhlas. But it's the ikhlas of the ordinary folk. You, you're not doing it for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when you do it, you're seeking the, your, your own portion of the dunya in that action and you're seeking your portion of the akhirah. Like, maybe you're fasting and you're seeking in your fasting that Allah is going to make you fit. That's not a bad thing necessarily. You're going to maybe get healthier. You're seeking your portion of the of the dunya in that. And you or, or maybe you giving something, you're giving a charity, and your mind is on the fact that Allah is going to give me ten times more. And you're thinking about the dunya. It's a reward. And it's a dunya we reward. It's not a problem. Right? But it's the he's telling you this is the level of the of the ordinary folk. And at the same time. When he does that action, he maybe wants a cure for his body. He wants Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to endow him with more rizq in this dunya. And he also wants Jannah and he wants the Hurun Ain and he wants all those things. I heard Mullah Khalil describing the Jannah last night. But he wasn't mentioning the Hurun Ain. Huh? I was going to tell Mullah, if Mullah said we become uh, desensitized maybe to those descriptions of Jannah because we know the garden route. Mullah must read the description of Jannah in Surah Naba. Uh, in the brothers, you know. <laughs> so, anyways, besides the point. But uh, so they say there's this level of the ordinary folk. They do the action. They're not doing it for other than Allah. They remove Allah subh. They remove other than Allah subhanahu wa taala from the interactions with Allah subhanahu wa taala. But they're still seeking the by the portion of the dunya and they're seeking in it the portion of the akhirah. And then he says there's the level of the elect slaves of Allah and what is the state of the ikhlas? The state of the ikhlas is that they do it, they remove Allah subhanahu, sorry, they remove other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the interaction with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but they don't seek any portion of the dunya in it, they're only seeking the portion of the akhirah. So they'll do all the good deeds and they don't care if it doesn't bring them any worldly benefit. I'm fasting because Allah told me to fast and I want reward in the akhirah from this. I'm giving charity. I don't care if it doesn't bring me more in this dunya. But I'm seeking reward in the akhirah for it. So you say, this is a second level of ikhlas. It's better than the first one. And that is the, the level of the elect slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then there is the level of the elect of the elect, the very, the, like the special ops servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that they remove other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the interaction with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they seek neither in it the portion of the dunya nor a portion of the akhirah. They only do it because they want to make manifest the essence as being the slaves of Allah. They do it. They, they say, فَعِبَادَتُهُمْ تَحْقِيقُ الْعُبُودِيَّةِ لِلَّهِ The only reason that they do it is because I am the slave of Allah and I want to do what's pleasing to Allah. I want to make manifest my nature as being the slave of Allah. And that's all that they, they care about. Right? They want to focus on what the Lord asks of them. Or they do it out of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or they do it out of longing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for nothing else. But is it wrong to want Jannah when you do your actions? No, of course not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who entices you in the Quran to do good with Jannah. And if you study fiqh, you'll, hear, you'll learn that Allah doesn't command you with anything or prohibit you from anything except that it benefits you in the dunya and the akhirah. Right? 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who deters you from doing a wrong by mentioning the, the, the pitfalls of Jahannam. So there's nothing wrong in focusing on that. All that we're saying is, as you traverse through those stages, your focus won't be on Jannah. Your focus will be on Allah. It's not that you don't want Jannah. It's just that you're overcome with love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you're not even if you didn't know about Jannah or you didn't know about Jahannam, you'd still worship Allah because you love Him. Even if you didn't know about Jannah or you didn't know about Jahannam or you didn't know about the worldly benefits of your actions, you would still worship Allah because you long for Him. And so, you may find like some of the people who have attained these states they would say at times in poetry and in times in prose, they would say, for example, like Ibn al-Farid said, لَيْسَ سُؤَالِي مِنَ الْجِنَانِ نَعِيمًا غَيْرَ أَنِّي أُحِبُّهَا لِأَرَاكَ He would say that my asking for Jannah is not because I desire the pleasures of Jannah. The only reason I ask for Jannah is on account of my love for seeing you. And they know that you will only see Allah if you attain Jannah. So remember I said, your longing for Jannah can be the best thing, or it can be a step below the best. Because if you know that if I am to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then necessarily I will have attained Jannah, because that's the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then longing for Jannah in that sense is not actually a longing for the bodily pleasures that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in Jannah, like the Hurun Ayn, or the food of Jannah, or the this, all the expansiveness of Jannah, all the beauty of its sights, or any of those things, but you seek Jannah because you know it's only the people who enter Jannah that will be allowed to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's still a longing for Jannah, but it's, it's not actually a longing for Jannah, it's a longing to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and just you know that Jannah comes along with that. Right? There's nobody that would... There's nobody that would say, that would advise you to say you don't want Jannah. Like you might, you might, be, you might have heard of the statement of uh, Rabi al adawiyah wherein she said, Oh Allah, if I am worshipping you uh, out of want for Jannah, then deprive me of it. And if I am worshipping you out of fear of the hellfire, then throw me into it. Right? She's not saying she doesn't want Jannah. She's just saying, if she's putting Jannah before her desire for Allah, then Allah must deprive her of that. But if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the focus and Jannah comes along with it, then it's not a problem. Then that is the state of the elect of the elect. You understand? But all of these are levels of ikhlas. All of these are levels of ikhlas. So if you find yourself worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and wanting that 10 times more in the dunya for your sadaqah, and wanting jannah for it, don't worry, that is a state of ikhlas. As long as you're removing, other than Allah, you're not doing it for, other than Allah. That is a state of ikhlas. And perhaps because of engaging in things with ikhlas at a lower level, Allah gives us ikhlas at a higher level. Right? So, so do not despair uh, at that account. In fact, that's one of the benefits of fasting. You can't, nobody really knows whether you're fasting. Yeah, I'm walking with a bottle of water that was in my bag now. Huh? And as I walked out of the cubicle, the app says, I thought, hey, what if somebody thinks that I took a sip of this thing here? It doesn't matter what people think. But nobody can really know whether I was behind the cubicle taking a sip of that water. How do you know? Only Allah knows. So in recognizing, like in fasting, that I could at many times, there's many opportunities for me to do things that break my fast, and everybody will think I'm fasting. It's actually a sign to the fact that I have ikhlas. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make that a reality. And it sounds bad to say it like that. But I mean, it's a level of ikhlas that you, one can realize on themselves. You don't know if I have ikhlas. Because you don't know if I took that sip of water. But each person can see it for themselves. Like... They can see that, no, perhaps I'm at that lowest level. And you should always be confident. And you should always be reminding yourself that you're not doing what you're doing for other than Allah. 
Because if any moment comes that you think you're doing it for other than Allah, you have to remove that intention from your heart. You can't carry on like that. Even if you're trudging along and plodding along with some ujub in there, you can't allow riya to enter there. Because remember, riya removes the validity, the acceptability of the action to start with. But ujub affects only the perfection of the action. And so we first try to have our building, and then we make that building perfect. Right. What's our time? How long have you been on now? So most of today was, I think, follow-ons from yesterday's discussion. But I don't know what I mean about you think, but I think that they are very important additions to that discussion, important framings of that discussion in how we wayfare to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. I think we'll end there for today, inshallah. Um, are there any questions? Bismillah. Can you ever be certain that you have a class? Look, I haven't experienced all of these things. So I can't say what happens at the higher echelons. Um, but I think a safe answer for most people would be that it's a constant battle. But there may be such a time when you're so focused on Allah that you're not even focused on whether you have ikhlas or not. But you actually have ikhlas. But Allah alam how that feels. So the safe answer would be that is a constant struggle. You're always making sure that you that your knee is right. That you're not giving other people a share in your ibadah, you're not sharing your ibadah with other than Allah, nor are you sharing your ibadah with your nafs. So the safe answer would be that it's a constant struggle. Any other questions? Bismillah. Another one? Bismillah. So you 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 find out about a good action and then you you want to do this action, but at the time of, of, of making that intention, you're looking at a, a number of other benefits, maybe dunya and ukhrawi, should you still engage in the action? That's the question, right? Yes, you should engage in the action. Remember, that is a level of ikhlas. It's not the absence of ikhlas. As long as you're not doing it for other than Allah, then you must carry on doing the action. And if you have an intention of doing it for other than Allah, Remember, that's a plot of shaitan to get you away from doing the good thing. So first strive to remove doing it for other than Allah from your intention and then still do the action. Fight yourself to remove doing it from other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from yourself. Because imagine if everybody, the moment they intend to do an action, shaitan comes to them and whispers to them that you're doing it for other than Allah. Now you stop. None of us will do good deeds. Shaitan, the mastermind, of getting us away from doing good deeds, will use it as his number one plan to stop us from doing anything. Right? So what we do at that moment is, we simply purify our intention. We remind ourselves, I'm not doing it for that person. I'm doing it for Allah. And then you carry on. And if you really, really, really can't, if you really can't, and then you seek further advice. Right? Or maybe you, change, you do a other good action that you can do without that intention. But don't forego the opportunity to do the good action. Right? But if you're not including in it other than Allah, you're doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, but you see you, your mind is somewhat focused on dunya we benefit and ukhra we benefit, still do it, it is a state of ikhlas. But strive for higher states of ikhlas at the same time. So strive to not focus on the dunya we think, if you can maintain that. Strive to not focus on the dunya we think, nor the ukhra we think. If you can maintain it. But don't stop. Because you've already attained a state of a level of ikhlas. And that level of ikhlas is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
So be wary of that. Don't fall prey to the traps of shaitan. I want to do a good thing. Shaitan comes and whispers in my mind that I'm doing it for other than Allah. Now I stop. You let him win. He took you away from doing the good thing. And that's the second best after getting you to do something bad. So don't let him win. Just remove that influence of shaitan in your intention. And, and how do you do that? You look internally and you tell yourself that you're not doing it for, for, for other than Allah. Uh, and we'll speak more about that tomorrow, inshallah. Yes. No, a good, good question. So I mentioned that if you find yourself where you are overly focused on the good traits of your nafs and you st it's starting to lead to self-amazement, then you do something mubah or makruh to, to bring yourself back down to earth. The question is, must that be done by the diagnosis of somebody else or can you self-diagnose? I would say that it depends on what it is you intend on doing. If it's mubah, you can self-diagnose. Right? If it's mubah, you can self-diagnose. If it's makru, then take advice. Then take advice. Unless the person is somebody who has studied all of these things and who understands it, and who has had some kind of approval in relation to the understanding, and then they may be able to diagnose for themselves. But that's not the ordinary circumstance. Right? So if it's mubah, you can self-diagnose. And if it's uh, makru, then I would advise to take advice. Now, but also when you do the mubah, you mustn't allow yourself to become excessive in that mubah. You must, you must keep in focus the, the purpose of that. You must recognize that, look here, if I'm doing something that's better, like I'm, very, like I'm living an uh, ascetic lifestyle, but I'm going to come down to other things that are mubah in order to save myself from ujb. You mustn't, you must remember that that state is actually better in and of itself, but that state without ujb is better. So I come down to this level of the mubah to the extent that it removes the ujb and then I can go back up to that ideal state without ujb. You understand? Um, because it may be that you start indulging in the mubah and the allure and the aesthetic pleasure and the nice taste of those things in the realm of mubah, it keeps you from going back up to the state of what was better without ujb. Right? And that's a come down from you know, your lofty aspirations of getting back to that high state. So you must remember that it's only a means to going back to what is better without the ujb. That's very important. Um, but anyways, life is really like an oscillation between you're always going one way to the good and then you might get carried away with yourself and then you need to overshoot a little bit. This is like a seesaw. Right? You always, you, it's very hard to maintain the balance in the center. A little wind can blow it, tilting to one side. And it can tilt ever so slightly and you can take it back ever so slightly, but it's always a slight oscillation. Yeah. Um, but the oscillation must never be between haram and halal. The oscillation can be between what is halal and halal, what is good and what is better. Now, all right. I think we end there, inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, accept us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to these lofty states. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us from good states to better states. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from bad states. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purify us into this night, uh, going into this night that's potentially the night of Qadr. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us find it with pure hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala find it with sincerity. May Allah allow us to find it in a state that's pleasing to Him and so that we can find Him in our actions and that we can meet Him and that we can cultivate longing for Him and love for Him and and seeking his pleasure, doing what he pleases and not what please us. With this, I end with Jazakum Allah Khairan wa Akhiru Da'wana and Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.